The drought and water situation, particularly in New South Wales, but of course affecting uh, most of the eastern seaboard of Australia. I'm joined now by the New South Wales Water Minister, Melinda Pavey. She's in the Sydney CBD. Thanks for joining us, uh, Melinda. First up, uh, the water restrictions uh, across uh, Sydney going up to uh, a higher level. Uh, how, how useful are these? Do you find that people generally uh, stick to the restrictions? It actually does reduce consumption? Absolutely, Chris. So, and actually, I thank the people um, of the Greater Sydney area, which includes the Illawarra. We've reduced our um, uh, use by about 10% since the first stage of restrictions came in. And from yesterday, unfortunately, um, people throughout the region won't be able to use their hoses on their lawns uh, to keep their vegetable patches alive or their herb gardens. Um, you can water from a bucket before 10 o'clock in the morning and after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but I understand and appreciate this is, you know, a tough decision that we've had to make. We brought that decision uh, early. We brought it forward. Uh, our, our previous water plan had said we do it at 45 percent, uh, sorry, at 40 percent. Um, but because we've seen such a, a drop in our catchment levels because of this drought, it's, it's in many parts of New South Wales, it is simply the worst drought on record. Uh, it's having a big impact on Sydney uh, as well as the Northern Basin in particular. Now, Sydney's population has more than doubled since the Warragamba Dam was completed. Have governments, Labor and Liberal, over those decades failed the people of New South Wales by not adding to water storage? Well, we did add to water storage and capacity uh, with the desalination plant that uh, was built following the Millennium Drought. Um, and I think that was a bit of a shock to the people of Sydney. And I, I was on the record as an opposition member of parliament at the time uh, saying that, you know, is this, is this the right decision? Because it was sort of foisted upon us. Uh, our government now is looking at doubling the capacity of that desalination plant. And if we do Ooh. that, that's an extra 30% of the water supply into Sydney. But in terms of dam storages, um, a very tricky uh, catchment to actually put new storages in, as you could imagine. So I'm agnostic about where, uh, where well, we get been, the water from. Uh, there have been other... Uh, there's been dams proposed in the Upper Hunter and rejected. There's been a proposal still ongoing to increase uh, the height of Warragamba. Uh, still can uh, conjecture over that. I mean, desalinisation plants are an incredibly expensive way to produce water. What's that costing uh, the people of New South Wales at the moment, the operation of that desal plant? It's about uh, $25 on an average water bill, Chris. Uh, uh, the Hunter Dam that the Christina Keneally and the Labor government uh, rejected after spending $100 million on it, um, that dam would not have serviced Sydney. Um, but yes, we are going through work at the moment, EIS and, and uh, environmental work at increasing the Warragamba Dam storage capacity in the event of a major event. It's not designed to add more water to, to the Sydney storage. Um, yes, desal is the way of the future. It's in Perth, it's in Adelaide. Um, they're spending another four and a half billion dollars on desalination plants in Israel. I just visited there recently yes. to understand better um, the way they've conquered their water crises. Well, uh, Israel's a is... different situation. The problem in Australia, uh, with the possible, ex well, with the, with the exception of Perth, is that uh, it's been government's uh, reluctance to build dams in, uh, in, in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia that has led them to go to desal plants as an expensive but politically easier option. Well, it's hard for me to comment on decisions and management practices of the past. I'm dealing with the crisis that we have today through lack of rain, through the worst drought on record in many parts of New South Wales. Uh, desalination uh, is, you know, in terms of costs, uh, it, it is less expensive than what it was, but it, it does require a lot of energy to be able to use it. We're also looking at other recycling options. We plan to, to plant 7 million trees here in Sydney by 2050, and the, and the best way to water those trees is with recycled water, not potable water, not drinking water. So we are getting better. We're fixing our leaks better, getting more out of the system. But I tell you, Warragamba Dam has been a magnificent water catchment, a great dam, um, and also currently under a bit of... Uh, under a bit of stress because of this drought, also through bushfires. We've had the fires go around uh, Warragamba Dam. We're working with our agencies and the Rural Fire Service at the moment to ensure the integrity of that water supply, uh, looking at putting curtains because when that rain does come, um, we're going to have some challenges as well, uh, protecting that in valuable, incredible water source. But, you know, we're doing that work uh, and 
yeah, it is. Uh, it had, has served our city in the most generous um, and wonderful way. And if we do get, um, you know, those beautiful East Coast lows, some, some tropical storm activity up north over this summer period, you know, that dam can actually fill in a very efficient amount of time. Now, as you mentioned, it's a bad drought at the moment, uh, uh, but experts, uh, I quote to Professor Andy Pittman, the preeminent expert in Australia, uh, he runs the Centre for Climate Extremes, says there's an insufficient evidence to link this drought to climate change, that uh, the long-term rainfall record in Australia is so variable that uh, there's no drying trend there to blame this drought on climate change, yet you're ministerial colleague Matt Keane is blaming the bushfires and by consequence the drought then on climate change. Is he getting ahead of himself? I know I represent one of those communities that has been affected by these fires. I've lost 130 for homes um, in my communities around Kempsey, around uh, Maxville and Nambuck and around Warhope and Dorigo. It, it's very traumatic but everyone on the ground knows that this is simply caused by a lack of rain. The stress on our forests um, is like we've never seen but we actually have seen it. In 1901 at Federation, uh, you know, we signed the paperwork on a dry riverbed at Wentworth on the, uh, the, the meeting of the Darling and of the Murray Rivers. We have had extreme drought. In 1974, we've had uh, fires that uh, consume twice the landmass than what we're experiencing here at the moment. So we have seen precedents. We have seen major events like this. Um, and we know that we've had climate change through this country, through this nation um, at, at all times. It is unpredictable. We have, we, you, Professor is right, we have a very variable rainfall across this state and across this continent. And that is why we are building dams in New South Wales, Chris. We're, we're looking at doubling the capacity of Wyangla Dam, a river system that is under enormous stress right at this very moment, um, following the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder sending 22 gigalitres of water down that system. Uh, so we need to, to create some more security for farmers and for communities there. Also in Tamworth, another area facing major drought, major issues, sustaining its industries like our chicken industry. Uh, we are going to build and, and improve that water storage system there at uh, Dungowan. And also uh, we're looking at options on the Mole River on the Queensland border. Another system where there's been talk and talk and talk and talk about a dam. We are moving with plans. We are going to do the work. We've got the money set aside from the sale of Snowy Hydro. Um, the Deputy Premier John Barillaro and Gladys Berejiklian supporting very much the building of dams in regional New South Wales. We're going to get it done because we've got to, we've got to you know, work to the risk that exists and that is that we have a very variable rainfall in this continent. We need more security for our farmers, our communities, our industry. Half the world's population is going to be living above Australia by around 2050. They're going to need a lot of good quality food that is grown in the best circumstances, the cleanest and the greenest. We need to be part of that supply chain. Melinda Pavey, it is just so refreshing to hear you honestly talking about the precedents here. We've had bushfires like this before. We've had droughts like this before. We've had these sorts of crises in this country before and we've got through them and we have to learn to live with them. We've even had smoke haze like this in Sydney before. I've cited ships getting lost in the fog in Sydney Harbour in 1936 and the like. But why is it then that members of even your own government, instead of talking about these as challenges that we've come through before and we need to knuckle down and get through now, they seem to want to hype up all this hysteria, pretend we've never confronted this before, and suggest that somehow climate policies can fix it. As the member for Oxley, my community keeps me very grounded in the realities. And I do have a lot of um, people that are very uh, of that view that this is all about climate change. And we have had challenges with uh, rainforest that is under threat, that has never burnt before. But I'm also very practical in understanding if we, we you know, we've got properties right beside national parks, if we don't have the barriers, if we don't have access to be able to ensure that we've got green space or we've got, you know, um, we've got ability to uh, be able to manage our own properties and our own fence lines, then we do have issues. So I'm, I'm so very just fortunate on that, to should, have... So just on that, Minister, sh shouldn't your Environment Minister then, Matt Keane, be focusing more on fuel reduction, hazard reduction in national parks, rather than trying to buy into the climate change campaign? 
Can I just say, uh, Matt and his team in national parks have done an incredible job during this fire. And I know, because I was the Shadow Emergency Services Minister before the 2011 election, we took a policy to the election that we were going to double the amount of hazard reduction. Well, we've done more than that. We've actually trebled it. And I believe in hazard reduction. I believe that we should be doing more in a line with uh, you know, our Aboriginal forebears. We know what the history books say in relation to, to Captain Cook and sailing past and seeing you know, regular um, billows of smoke and fire. But I also um, am very aware that no matter how much hazard reduction that we could have done, and it's very difficult to do hazard reduction um, during a drought because the risks are, are quite there. You know, we've had so much stress on the forest floor in recent times that, you know, with all the hazard reduction, you know, you, you wouldn't have been able to solve these problems because drought comes with its own set of problems. And that is what we are experiencing, an incredible stress on the forest floor. Uh, with leaves and branches, um, you know, dropping because simply there's been no water for those trees. So it, it's a balanced discussion. And I don't want us to, to, to go into um, a future discussions just blaming one thing. This is a variety of issues. We have to learn from every experience. We've learned from previous bushfires. You know, we changed our planning code so that, um, you know, we weren't able to build right in the middle of a forest. But some of those homes still exist. You know, there is stresses. But the best thing we can do is maintain our fire breaks, being able to get access, ensure that we have good perimeters around our properties, around our homes, around our sheds. We all have good fire plans. You know, that is the, the simple things that we can do to give ourselves more protection. Uh, but it, it's, it's a whole suite of solutions. Spot on. Um, Spot and, on, uh, Minister. Thanks. Uh, very, very uh, sound assessment of what we need to do. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris.